Max Freed is dominant again, and the Braves get some heroics from Travis Demerit in a 3-1 win over the Chicago Cubs on Tuesday. We'll break down the win and set you up for Wednesday's matchup between the two teams as the Braves look to get their first series win of the season. We'll talk about all that on today's episode of Locked On Braves, so let's get into it. You are Locked On Braves, your daily Atlanta Braves podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, and welcome back to Locked On Braves, brought to you as part of the Locked On Sports Atlanta Network, where we talk about your favorite Atlanta sports teams every day. I am your host, Jake Mastriani. You can follow me on Twitter at shortstopball. You can check out my bio there to see where I am covering the game of baseball, including the Atlanta Braves in written form over at tomahawktake.com. Also, make sure you follow the podcast on Twitter at lockdown underscore Braves and subscribe to the Lockdown Braves podcast wherever you get your podcast. Subscribe to us on YouTube as well. And thanks for making Lockdown Braves your first listen each and every day. We post episodes daily, five days a week. Monday through Friday, and we are free and available on all platforms. On today's podcast, we'll be talking about the Braves' 3-1 win over the Chicago Cubs on Tuesday. Max Freed's great performance, Travis Demerit coming up with some big plays, and then we'll also preview Wednesday's matchup as well. But let's jump right into the big story of the day in Max Freed, and yet again, with another very good performance following up his dominant outing in L.A. Six innings, four hits, one earned, coming on a solo home run, no walks, and four strikeouts, picks up the win. His only real mistake in this game was a changeup that he left right down the middle against Ian Happ, who already had good numbers against him coming in, as we talked about. Other than that, I mean, look, he had trouble that he had to work out of. It's not like it was a, it wasn't for me as a dominant as a performance as we saw in LA, but nothing that was ever really too concerning. He gave, gave up a leadoff double in the second to Wilson Contreras, but it worked out of that. Uh, after the Hap homer in the third, he gave up a single, but got out of that with a double play. Gave up a two out single in the fourth inning before Travis Demerit made a nice catch to end that threat. And then a throwing error by Austin Riley in the fifth inning put put a runner on second with one out. But then Freed made a really great play on a comebacker that caught the runner in between second and third. So they were able to cut him down, and then he got out of that inning as well. Um, Still, even after that, he had a wild pitch and a hit batter that put two on and two outs in the fifth. But Freed struck out Seiya Suzuki to end that threat. Um, one game, but the Braves pitching staff did a really good job of holding down Sayad Azuki, who was the Cubs by far the Cubs' best hitter coming into this series. The first and sixth innings, so his first and last, were his only were Freed's only one, two, three innings of the game. So he did have traffic in between there, but again, it just felt like he was in control the entire time. I thought he could have gone a little longer. Threw 89 pitches. He threw 92 his last time out. So I feel like he was stretched out. And the next step would have been for him to throw around 100 pitches. But again, Snit got him out of there. Kind of a wet night. You saw Freed slip on the mound once. I talked about the throwing air from Riley on a slow roller. That I think that probably had a little bit to do with it. So probably why Snicker wanted to just go ahead and get him out of there. Turn it over to the bullpen. Make sure that they get that win. Again, not an overly dominating start by Max Freed in terms of strikeouts and swings and misses. He only had nine swings and misses in this game, but got a lot of weak contact. His average exit velocity against was just 83.5 miles per hour. You compare that to Marcus Stroman, whose average exit velocity against was 93.3 miles per hour. So Braves hitters were squaring him up. They almost averaged a hard hit every time they put the ball in play against Marcus Stroman, while Max Freed's average exit velocity was 10 miles per hour less than what it was for Stroman. So Freed just getting a a lot of weak contact, you know, mixing his pitches well, 
Now that fastball, curveball, slider was what he really featured against the Cubs on Tuesday. And the Cubs don't strike out a lot. They were one of the uh, team, one of the best teams in baseball right now at not striking out. So Freed just attacked the zone. Like I said, got a lot of weak contact and didn't walk anyone. Something really been harping on with the pitching staff is the number of walks. And Freed did a great job of limiting walks, no walks. Uh, in this outing. So that was great to see back-to-back -back starts now without issuing, issuing a walk. And we're starting to see the Max Freed we all know and love, you know, after a little bit, a couple of rough outings to begin. And really in those outings, it was just one inning, you know, in each of those outings where things kind of got away from him. Other than that, he's looked like Max Freed, but now he's starting to put it together, start to start throughout from beginning to end. So that is great to see as he makes a push for that NL Cy Young, which I think he will be in the discussion for if he stays healthy all year long. And then the other star in this game was Travis Demerit. And look, I, I might start the hashtag play that man because that's what I keep saying. And what I've been asking for is just play Travis Demerit. What do you have to lose at this point? You need a spark in your outfield. You know, maybe it's just something where he's hot for. A week, two weeks, a month, I don't know. But what do you have to lose right now, especially with Rosario out? Play Travis Demerit. See if the changes he's made at the plate are for real and if he is becoming the hitter that a lot of people thought he could be when he was a first-round pick You know, a while back with the Rangers. He's still just 27 years old, and it looks like he's starting to figure some things out. So, again, I'm not saying he's going to be an all-star but with Rosario out, I feel like Demerit deserves a, to get a long look in the outfield, an extended look of playing time. Hopefully, Snicker continues to roll him out there. He has a hit in every game he's played in so far. And, of course, uh, I'm bearing the lead a little bit. He had the big go-ahead home run on Tuesday, a first-pitch cutter running away from him. He just dropped the barrel on the ball and hit it out into the chop house. Uh, just a great swing, a big hit in that game. And then he made a great play defensively as well. And look, I've been asking for this from a Braves outfielder, somebody who has some range, and he was able to run down a ball in foul ground, making a sliding catch, a ball I thought he had no chance getting to, uh, and it was just a, a great catch. I jumped out of my seat because I just couldn't believe it, and – uh, it was a great game for Travis Demerit. I mean, look, that's a small sample size. I'm going to need to see more from him. Obviously, the jury is still out on him as a defensive player. His metrics were terrible in Detroit in 2019. Over 411 and two-thirds innings, he had negative nine defensive runs saved. But in 2020, in just 56 innings, he had two defensive runs saved. So, Again, I don't, I'm not saying he's going to be an elite defender, but I know he covered some serious ground to catch that foul ball, and that's something that I've really been harping on. It's not necessarily errors for these Braves outfielders. It's the lack of range and not being able to get to some of these balls. So it's nice to see Travis track down that ball, make a great catch to end that inning. So a great game for Max, great game from Travis as they led the Braves on Tuesday to a win. All right, next, I want to talk about some other takeaways from the games, including Matt Olson, Austin Riley, Dansby Swanson, and the Braves bullpen. Before we do that, let me tell you about our next prodder product who has a partner who has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I have two young kids at home, and as you can tell, my voice is always a little bit raspy, especially during the winter and spring season with all the germs they're bringing home from daycare. I struggle to stay healthy during those parts of the year. Now I've been on it for a while and I love it and it's doing wonders for my immune system. It doesn't taste like it's super healthy. It has a kind of mild tropical taste that I actually look forward to each morning with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens. One, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. The special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focused, and aging, 
all the things that you're looking to. Athletic Greens was created when the founder experienced a ton of gut health issues and ended up on a complicated supplement routine. It cost him $100 a day. He created Athletic Greens after experiencing how difficult it was to create an optimal nutrition routine on your own. Athletic Greens costs you less than $3 a day, and it's cheaper than getting all the different supplements yourself. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash MLB network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash MLB network to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Couple more thoughts from Tuesday's game. Offense still necessarily not going. Uh, Only scored three runs on six hits and no walks. They were really aggressive in this game against Stroman. I mentioned already, you know, they hit Stroman really hard with an average exit velocity of 93.3 miles per hour. But again, not much luck. 15 hard hit balls overall in this game. They had five, the hot. They had the five hardest hit balls in this game, but only two of them were hits. The sixth inning in particular, and I tweeted this out during the game, was pretty much just a, a an overall look of what the Braves' offense has been this year. They had three straight lineouts. All were hard hit balls with launch angles around 20 degrees, which is what you want, and two were hit at 105 miles per hour or harder. But again, all three were lineouts. So, that's just been some of the Braves' luck this year. I don't know if the balls are actually dead, if they actually changed them. I haven't really seen that confirmed anywhere. So if you have that info, let me know. I know that's what a lot of people are speculating. Or if it's just this time of year. I feel like we always complain early in the year about the lack of offense, the lack of home runs. And then come June, July, the balls are flying out of the park. The air is a lot warmer. And things seem to be normalized. So... We'll just have to see how it plays out. But certainly right now, the Braves have been affected by the lack of home runs to this point. And the ball is just not traveling as far as we're used to seeing. Only three opportunities with runners in scoring position in this game. The Braves were over three and just three left on base. So not an overly impressive performance from the offense. Again, hit the ball hard, but hitting it to the wrong spots. But they were able to score without Matt Olson and Austin Riley, who each went over four in this game. But they just had one strikeout between the two, and that was a questionable call on Matt Olson in an RBI spot. A pitch up and in that looked like a ball was called a strike, and that left a runner stranded at third with only one out. And then Riley popped out to or flew out to end the inning. They each had a couple of hard hit balls, though. I mean, nothing to worry about about these two just pointing out the fact you know the Braves were able to score without either one of them you know having a big day but again overall I think they were still good at bats from Olsen and Riley again a tough call there from Olsen uh, with a chance to drive in a runner from third and I thought it was another positive game for Dansby Swanson good again I'm looking for any signs of Dansby getting going and this is now three or four games in the past week where he's looked significantly more competent at the plate and that is a great sign had another hit in this game scored a run the abati struck out on you know he took it full after falling behind one and two um and that the guy the cubs had out there ethan roberts he had some serious movement on his pitches he struck out the side that inning but i still thought it was a a solid at bat from dansby again another just kind of solid overall game for him the night shift locked things down At the back end of the game, you had Will Smith, Tyler Matzik, and Kenley Jansen come in. Three innings, no hits, no walks, no earned, and two strikeouts between them. Smith has been fantastic in his new role, and it's honestly a role I think he should have been in from the beginning. He's always seemed like more of a setup guy than a closer to me, although he did great in the closer role. But I just feel like this is where 
he really thrives in that seventh, eighth inning role where I think we're going to see him this year. Again, not getting a ton of strikeouts, but he's in the 89th percentile for average exit velocity against, so not giving up a lot of hard hits. And again, seems to be thriving in that seventh inning role, so that's certainly great news there. Tyler Matzik, on the other hand, not really as sharp in this one. I think overall, you know, the numbers are there. I don't think he's been quite as sharp uh, this season as we're used to seeing from him. And look, what he did in the postseason was absolutely amazing. So it's kind of hard to always duplicate that performance. But this game in particular, he wasn't wasn't sharp, still got outs. You know, he hit a batter. Both balls put in play against him were hit really hard. But he got a great play from Adam Duvall, who ran down a ball in right center and was able to get the ball back and play for a double play. Great relay by Dansby Swanson as Duvall just kind of chucked it back in. Dansby was able to go track it down, make a good throw to first to get the double play. And then Kenley Jansen coming in uh, to finish off the game. He has now gone six straight appearances without giving up a hit, and he's only issued a one walk with nine strikeouts over those last six appearances. So since his first outing of the year, which, you know, in those hits in that game were just little bloops, he hasn't given up a hit. So Kenley Jansen has been really good at the back end of games for the Atlanta Braves in that bullpen. And again, somebody asked the other day, I don't remember if it was Monday or Tuesday, uh, if we should be worried about the bullpen. And, you know, my same reasoning then, I think kind of played out on Tuesday. Is I'm not worried about the bullpen at all, especially about these guys and the high leverage guys. We've seen some blowups from McHugh, from Newcomb, from some others, but not those that you're really going to rely on in these type of games like Will Smith, Tyler Matzik, Kenley Jansen, A.J. Minter. Those guys have been locked down. They're doing their job, so I'm not worried about the bullpen at all. It was a rough weekend for them against the Marlins, but I think this bullpen will be just fine going forward. And then maybe my most exciting news from this game or takeaway from this game is the outfield defense, and I've kind of already mentioned it a little bit here and there but the trades plays by travis demerit and adam duvall that's what i've been looking for that's what this braves team has been missing again i don't know i need to see more of demerit but it was certainly a breath of fresh air to be talking about positive talking positively about this outfield defense instead of all the negative stuff we've been seeing to begin the year so two great plays out there by this defense that really helped this, it helped in this game so that is certainly a great development and hopefully something we see going forward next we will preview wednesday's matchup and talk about how the braves are going to get their first series win of the year before we do that let me tell you about built bar they are the best tasting protein bar out there as you already know all built bars covered in 100 percent real chocolate and they already taste great with many great flavors like mint brownie, peanut butter brownie, and my favorite, the cookies and cream. Not only are they great tasting, they're great for you as well. Most Built Bars contain just 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Compare that to a candy bar, which usually has 200 to 300 calories in them. And you can see why, pro, why, why Built Bars are the preferred choice for your protein bar. Go to built.com, use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Again, use promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. On Wednesday, it'll be Mark Leiter Jr. versus Charlie Morton. I already guaranteed a win in this game, which means I am guaranteeing a series win for the Atlanta Braves, it would be their first of the year, and it is about time. So hopefully Charlie doesn't make me look like an idiot on Wednesday. But again, I mean, this has to be a win for this Braves team. Charlie is due for a good outing coming off a couple of rough starts, and really it's just been the beginning of the game. So it'll be very important to see how Charlie looks early in this game, if he's able to get off to a good start and get rolling. I think we could see him go six, seven innings, you know, two earned or less. It's kind of what I thought he would do last time, but I'm going to keep saying it until he does it. But, again, I think he, he will against this aggressive Cubs lineup. 
be able to get some weak contact just like Max was and be able to breeze through six or seven innings in this game. Mark Leiter Jr., he's off to a horrendous start in 2022, which probably means he's going to dominate the Braves. That just always seems to be the way that it is. If a unknown pitcher is somewhat struggling, uh, it seems like those are the pitchers that the Braves struggle with from time to time. But hopefully that's not the case on Wednesday and they can get to him. Mark Leiter Jr. has six walks in just seven and a third innings. He's also given up eight hits, nine earned runs, and two home runs. He primarily throws a sinker at 91 miles per hour. He also throws a cutter, curveball, and changeup. He has a big speed differential between his sinker and his curveball. He'll be trying to keep Braves hitters off balance with that and trying to create some weak contact. Um, hasn't lasted more than four innings or thrown more than 74 pitches this year in a start so make him work sit on that sinker lay off those off speed pitches outside the zone and i think this braves team will be just fine i know they were very aggressive against marcus stroman on tuesday i'd like to see them be a little bit more patient against mark Leiter jr see if he can issue some free passes get some pressure on him on the base pass work that pitch count get into that cubs bullpen um could be a game we see sean newcomb make an appearance so that's the plan of attack for the Braves on Wednesday. Again, I think it's a very winnable game, a game that they probably should win with Charlie Morton on the mound going up against Mike or Mark Leiter Jr. So I'm going to say the Braves win 7-2, to two, uh, making a prediction. I don't normally make predictions on here, but I'm going to go with a 7-2 to two win for the Braves on Wednesday. And again, that first series win of the year. Hopefully that's what we're talking about on Thursday. And then lastly, just a quick update on Ronald Acuna Jr. He's expected to play seven innings in the outfield today on Wednesday and then nine innings in the field on Thursday. Don't really have a game plan after that. I think he'll probably either take the day off on Friday or they'll stick him at the DH spot and just see how he responds from playing back-to-back -back games in the field. And then I think we'll either see him play another game and Gwinnett in the field on Saturday and potentially Sunday, setting him up for a, re a return to the Braves May 2nd in New York. I think there's a slight possibility um, that perhaps they bring him to Arlington after, he, depending on how he responds after the two games in the field on Wednesday and Thursday. But my guess is more likely he sticks around in Gwinnett. They give him more time to see how he responds, maybe get him another game or two, and then get him ready in new york of course there's always a chance they stick with the original plan and we don't see him till may 6th but again my kind of feeling all along has been that he'll be there for that series in new york and i certainly hope that's the case because they're going to need him against that mets team that will do it for this episode of locked on braves be sure to follow us on twitter at locked on underscore braves you can follow me at shortstop ball also make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you get some, your podcast subscribe to us on youtube as well and hit that notification bell so that you get notified every time we post a new episode but that will do it for this episode and we will talk to you next time